My name is Sierra Noble and I play the fiddle. And I've been doing that since I was about seven years old when my dream to play the fiddle actually came true. And I've been learning all different styles of music, but um, mostly focusing on promoting the Métis culture and just um, living it, really. Métis people are um, people that are of mixed blood. The main ingredient is Native ancestry, to be a Métis. They are mixed with Europeans, which includes uh, French, Irish, the Scottish. Playing the fiddle was always a dream of mine when I was little. We didn't really have the money for violin, and finally we, we moved to this house here, and my next door neighbor is the principal bassoonist in the Winnipeg Symphony. So he said, well, I can probably try and get you a, a violin teacher, and she basically taught me for next to nothing, and she lent me a violin. Even though she, she went to school and learned to, to study music, she didn't stop there. Even though she's a good fiddler, really, she didn't stop there. I discovered Métis music, and I fell in love with it. I've been playing it ever since, and I'll never stop playing And she went learning from a lot of our old-time fiddlers, and the veterans. She wanted to learn and, and feel and, and touch the sound exactly as the way we should be playing it, according to our, the oral tradition that's been passed on. Music for us is, is fundamental to who we are, and the fiddle is very, very important to us. And if we lose that, uh, I think part of our nation will slowly die. And if we continue to lose pieces of our, of our tradition, our culture, then eventually our nation, for what we believe in, will no longer exist. There's good evidence that stringed instruments have been in North America for millennia. And certainly they were brought again with the European contact. And more and more as the Scots came over and the French, it was all part of the fur trade, the Métis were very much involved in that. The Métis have a very unique style of fiddling. The fiddle tunes have a steady pulse, but the meters can be uh, you know, instead of one, two, three, one, two, three, they can be one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, and so on. In fact, I once had a, a Brandon fiddler tell me that he just couldn't play with those Métis fellas. They, they don't keep the meters. It's a very percussive playing. If you want to liken that to the main instrument of the Aboriginal people, the drum, you could. They choke up on the bow and they get a very strong percussive sound. Uh, they use their feet, uh, which some people say is a replication of the drum beat. The violin is, is like a voice. Métis fiddle music is uh, most definitely an oral tradition. And like most other things in Aboriginal culture, it wasn't consciously taught. People can understand that there's there's learning from school and learning how to play the notes and, and play the fiddle, but it's not the same as the learning the traditional Métis music from the old time fiddlers. And I think in a way that's what makes it such an active tradition. Learning from a teacher is a very passive way of learning, isn't it? And we emphasize it so much, but it was learned by observation, by intent watching a very active way of learning. I've known Sierra since she was nine. The center um, has always worked for preservation of Métis history and culture. And one of the workshops that we um, started doing was traditional Métis fiddling. And Sierra's mom had called, because we were booked up, 
and said, could you please make room for this nine-year-old girl? So I said, come on down. And that's where I met Tommy Knot. Tommy Knot is the most warm and loving old guy I've ever met, and he's an amazing traditional fiddler. And um, he taught me most of what I knew when I was younger, and he still teaches me a lot. Just enough to get her started, you know, that's all she needed was somebody to sort of help her to get on the right track, you might say. How was the second part, Gus? And I could see she had the ability to improve, and she did, you know, she, and she still is improving. My own style, I guess, has developed over the years greatly, but um, the fiddlers that I've learned from, like Tommy, I've found that if I'm actually playing with them, I play a lot like them, and I can almost imitate their style. But um, many people in the past four years have really seen a uh, style, like a Sierra style, I guess you could say, developing. She doesn't uh, fancy it up, whatever tune they show her. She honors them back by playing it the way that she was taught. So for me, it's just, um, there's no better bridge when you get old people and young people together to come to some sort of understanding of what music is about. And I think that's the only reason I can play the fiddle as well as I do, I guess, because I've just sat with Tommy for so long and many other fiddlers too and just listened and learned from them that way. Close. That's good. And one day, you know, I'll say 50 years from now, there'll be young kids talking about Sierra. That's the fiddler you go learn from. That's the traditional Métis music. It still lives today. <laughs> sitting here at a great Canada Day celebration at Cinewine Park. I am playing here today and have a great band along with me and some square dancers. By playing the traditional music on stage and but having a really great band that kind of kicks it up a bit, I get to share that with the people that don't necessarily know the Métis music. days have been crazy trying to prepare this day and all my shows and stuff. Got two performances here at St. Wine Park and then I have a radio interview and have a wedding to play at, it's my teacher's wedding. And then I'm going out to St. Francis Xavier to play up there. It's very, very busy. My mom is my driver, my booking agent, my manager, my everything. She's a great mom too and yeah, she does so much for me and I could never repay her. Well, when my mom and I travel, um, there's always little fights here and there and frustrations and just being tired and needing a break from each other. We're always really, really busy. Lots of playing, lots of driving and that usually concludes in long nights and early mornings. The Red River Jig is known as the, kind of as the Métis National Anthem. And unlike other anthems, it's just a fiddle tune. Out of the tune became a dance, which is known as the Red River Jig also. And um, it's been a part of the Métis culture and it's been kind of a, um, something that everybody recognizes um, as Métis forever and it always will be. When I was about 10 years old, I saw a display about landmines during the War Child Conference. And um, I 
started reading about landmines and about the effects they have on children and the effects they have on the world itself, and I couldn't believe it. Ever since that day, I've been really involved in doing fundraisers and organizing concerts, benefit concerts, and uh, I plan to do that for a long time now. When I do school presentations, I kind of tie in everything in my life, um, from the landmine work to my cultural work to my music um, to teaching them how to jig. It's kind of hard to imagine how I would tie it all in, but it all works out in some way. And um, it always kind of leaves the kids thinking about who they are and who their family is and where they're from, and they start really taking action in that part of their life. And I've kind of been told by many youth that they actually went and visited their grandparents after I called them to. And if you can teach something, you can really understand it a lot more. I wrote Grandma Blanche when I was about 11 years old. My great grandma, her name was Blanche Gaylord. She taught me a lot when I was little and she was almost kind of like a best friend to me every time I saw her. The summer she died, I was at fiddle camp. I didn't know anybody, that was the first year I went there. I went up to John Arcand and Gordon Stoby, um, two of the instructors at fiddle camp and I was talking to them a bit about what happened and they told me to come to the composer's workshop and they wanted to help me write a tune for her because they knew music would help me. So I went there the next day and we all were kind of thinking about people that we've lost and um, it was really hard for me to actually write music when I was thinking about it but um, in the end they said that I really wrote most of the tune and it was it was really awesome to also be able to co-write a tune with two of my favorite fiddlers. I didn't even really cry that week at all about it and I never really grieved her death until this year. Um, yeah, that was the birth of Grandma Blanche. Um, I've never met my dad, and um, he he left just after I was born, I think. And um, he lives in Ontario now, um, but I don't know, I've never really had much of a connection to him. I don't talk to him very often, and it's been really hard not having a dad growing up, and um, I think it's really important for a girl to have a dad to to be around, and um, but I didn't have that. But um, it's not all that bad because um, music has really formed um, an even more amazing family than I could ever have. And I have many, many dads and uncles and aunties and other moms and sisters and brothers that aren't in any way related to me, but I love them nonetheless and they've embraced me into their families and into their lives and um, I don't really need my dad um, honestly he's if yeah he made the choice not to be here and I've made the choice to move on and make my own family but she's challenged with this whole area of identifying herself as part of the Métis Nation. And Sierra's family originates, her father originates from the United States. And a lot of the uh, archives from the States have been lost or destroyed. Um, and we're pretty sure that it's 
on my dad's side that the Aboriginal blood is on. And uh, she uh, claims very strongly she's Métis, or her mother claims she's Métis. To the government, I'm not proven as Métis yet, but um, the MMF is working on my genealogy right now to help me prove that I am. Uh, we're tracking down the records to, to uh, solidify that. Uh, because in her heart, and her soul, and her mind, and, and her music, she is Métis. And uh, in my eyes, she is Métis. But honestly, to me, um, even if I'm not proven to be Métis by blood, um, my heart, my soul, my spirit, and everything I do about in my life is um, Métis. And um, I'll always be Métis, as far as I'm concerned. Just before Batash, I joined up with the Red River Métis Heritage Group, and they um, they rode into Batash with all of their carts and wagons. They've been doing like three to six week trips every summer, um, going towards Batash. And finally, this summer they got to Batash. Yeah, it's always a lot of work to keep the carts up and running, and they've lost two horses and one person died from cancer last year and so it's been a really tough journey for them but they really embrace every aspect of the Métis culture and the Métis people and the history and they kind of um, learned the history by themselves just by experiencing it. I was walking in front of all of them with four kids beside me and um, we walked in really proudly because that was the last stretch of their three-year journey. Oh, Batash is, is uh, such a symbolic place for us. It's a, it carries so much history and it's a place for us to, to gather and meet and, and talking about the politics and, and the challenge we face as a people, as a nation. But mostly music and, and, and dance is, is, is fundamental there. You want to find fiddle music, Batash is the place to be. Every annual uh, gathering is, is packed. There's over 10,000 people that show up and, uh, and it'll continue. It's growing and growing. There's just so much pride to um, be Aboriginal. And um, it's just amazing to see and amazing to be a part of that. You can just um, really feel the, the friendship and the, the family kind of connection. Everybody's just so happy to be there. There's a resurgence for sure that's taking place in the Métis homeland in, in the West, and uh, where Batash is, is for us is, is the gathering place. Well, I think the important thing to remember about a culture is this. We need to understand who we are. We need to understand who we are in the context of the world, but we also get our information from our culture. And culture isn't just a word, you know, like it's dry. Culture is a live thing. It grows out of our songs, our patterns of speech. It grows out of our languages, and the languages in turn grow out of where we are. So if we let our culture die, what happens is we start to forget who we are. And we're not always good at creating a new who we are. We need to be rooted in where we came from or else it just doesn't work. Cultural music is not only a music, but it is a representation of all the sounds, all of the great feelings and all of the thoughts that have come before us, especially in that culture. And it feeds us and it helps us to sustain who we are in our hard times. And if, if you look back at the hard times that anybody has had in their culture, they've often sustained their identity and found solace in the songs and the dancing and the musics of their culture. And it's something that's as familiar to them as their mother's heartbeat.
Tommy said once, fiddle's just a great pastime, and that's, that's true, I guess, but it's a lot more than that to me.